and ultimately we can scale so if our system becomes more popular, which means we will experience an increase in load and demand, we can address this by throwing more hardware in the program. The system will automatically take advantage of this hardware without changing a single line of code. This is obviously a very nice problem to have. At least as equally important, and not so obvious, is the ability to isolate individual errors and bugs that inevitably happen in runtime. Uh, because if you have a concurrent system, and those concurrent tasks are truly isolated, properly isolated, so then individual errors and individual tasks should not disturb the entire system. And for the most part, we should be able to have a system that is up and running, providing its service continuously to all of its users all of the time. So we have a highly available system. And I believe that this is a critical property, very important property, if you want to serve a multitude of users across the world continuously 24 7. So yeah, there are some very nice benefits when it comes to concurrency. And Active Model allows us to implement concurrent systems and simplify reasoning about such systems. Because this is something that is hard to do, hard to get right, relying on traditional approaches of shared mutable state and synchronization mechanisms such as locks, mutexes, semaphores, critical sections. So in the Active Model, we abandon this idea of a shared state and the state is instead somehow dispersed, distributed across individual participants of our system, our building blocks known as actors. And an actor is a concurrent computational entity, which is a fancy way of saying it is a thing that runs code and does so concurrently to all others. Two actors uh, run concurrently and they may run concurrently. Each actor possesses some piece of knowledge about the state, some piece of puzzle, and we call this an actor state, which is internal, private to each actor, and no other actor may directly access it or manipulate it. And in this sense, actors are fully isolated, independent, live their own separate lives, and they're kind of like components that just have to live inside the same operating system process. They will, of course, have to cooperate and coordinate, and for this purpose, we can use messages. Actors may communicate via messages, and this is also known as message passing concurrency. So a message here is essentially some data. In there, we will usually have some kind of a message identifier, something like deposit, withdraw, store, retrieve, and then, of course, depending on the message type, we may have some additional data, such as the amount of money. And when the message is received, an actor will handle it, will process it by running some code, performing some computations, maybe it will talk to some other actors, maybe it will change its state, maybe it will send a response back. And this response is sent, it is also sent back as a message. Um, the message itself must be either a full, uh, full deep copy or otherwise a full immutable, because we cannot allow sharing of mutable data between two actors, then the whole idea falls apart and we are back in the land of logs and critical sections. Um, sending of a message itself must be, uh, it is, uh, asynchronous fire and forget kind of operation, which uh, means that a caller actor sends a message, then moves on doing something else. Meanwhile, the message will be handled and rece received and handled concurrently to the caller actor. So remember, two actors always are concurrently. However, from the standpoint of a single actor, messages are handled one by one in the order of arrival. So an actor is internally sequential. It handles the message, and while it's doing this, all others that arrive in the meantime will somehow pile up in some kind of a mailbox. And when we are done with the current message, we can take the next one and handle that. So, in this sense, an actor acts as a synchronization point for competing requests. And we may, for example, issue simultaneous requests wanting to manipulate or query the same bank account. Corresponding messages will arrive in some order, and we will handle them in this order, keeping the integrity and consistency of our state. The implementation then is pretty straightforward. Here it's provided in Elixir, a very promising, interesting programming language that targets a like virtual machine. But irrespective of the language or the platform, the general idea, the gist of it is the same. So, when you implement your actor, you will want to support some messages. Those messages comprise your interface, how the rest of the world talks to you. And then you will implement handlers for those messages, and those handlers, you will do something, right? You will run some code, you will perform some computations, Maybe you will talk to some other actors, maybe you will change your state, maybe you will send a response back. So, no particular philosophy about it. Then, um, we must start our actor, and by starting it, we will obtain its address. And this address will then subsequently be used to communicate with this actor. And then finally, we have clients, which will be completely different actors somewhere in the system. They must obtain this address somewhere, and once we have the address, we can send our messages, optional waiting for the response, which is the very last line in the case number three, so the balance will be sent back as a message. And here, of course, everything is wrapped, hidden behind function call, which is standard practice in Elixir and Erlang. Underneath, we have this message passing mechanism taking place, those semantics apply. 
but the code remains easy to follow and understand. And that relying on, those simple, on this simple primitive, we can truly build highly concurrent systems and still be able to grasp them, to understand how they work, how different pieces cooperate and coordinate, what are our dependencies, what are our synchronization points, what are our possible bottlenecks. And then ultimately we can reap all those great benefits of concurrence such as uh, scalability, parallelism, efficiency, fault tolerance. So yeah, that was a basic introduction to actors. And for the rest of this talk, I will provide some more realistic example, inspired by the system I have built for my previous employer. So when I say inspired, I will somewhat diverge from the true story. I will enter the realm of fiction and fantasy and talk both about things I have done and things I should have done in order to make a better point, hopefully. So yeah, the system. It implements a feature which is called Live Betting. This feature allows end users, so called players, to, allow, to uh, arrive on the online betting site and place bets on matches which are currently in play. And since we are dealing with something that is currently happening, we are obviously dealing with a continuously changing stream of information that we have to constantly transmit to end users in near real time. We cannot afford significant delays between what we're presenting and what's happening in reality in those matches. And this stream is changing pretty rapidly, pretty frequently. Those numbers that you see by most of the screenshot, they are, they are so-called betting bots or coefficients, and they determine the amount of money a player may win in the case of a successful bet, and they change very rapidly per single match. So the whole system is powered by, uh, by many components, but in this talk I will focus only on two of them. The first one is a job, a thing that runs continuously and prepares this data that describes everything. And this is then ultimately used to present this shiny, colorful user interface. And the second component is a long polling based HTTP push server that accepts the data from this job and distributes it to all connected users, a couple of thousand of them in big times. So yeah, this is definitely not a super huge system, but I like to think of it as moderately loaded and there are some interesting challenges there. The implementation is for the most part done in Erlang with bits and pieces of Elixir, and we also use Ruby in a couple of places. And for the most part, I will focus on the job, on this thing that prepares the data before we give it to HTTP push server. And this is a deceptively simple problem that holds a lot of potential for concurrency, as I have discovered through some amount of pain and suffering. So, yeah, the high level overview of what we have to do here. Uh, we have a third party company, which is the origin of our data, our data source. We establish a PCP connection to their server, and through this connection, we continuously receive stream of XML messages, each message describing some changes to multiple matches. And we then have to interpret those messages, and we continuously incrementally build our own server-side model, our own view of the world, which is uh, embellished by the data from our own database. We apply some of our own business rules there. And once we update the model, we usually have to store some entities to the database, most frequently those betting odds. Then we strip some fields we don't need on the client side, we encode the JSON, give it to HTTP, push server which takes care of the rest. So my initial take on this problem was purely sequential. What I would do is I would establish a TCP connection and for each message I would run steps 1 through 6, then take the next message and repeat. And when placed against a real stream of those messages, this has proven to be a very impressive, a very spectacular failure. It was not able to cope even with the moderate flow of messages. It would fall behind, delays would be measured in minutes. So this thing was completely unusable. And uh, yeah, it's safe to say there was some room for improvements there. So what was the problem? Let's say, and I'm completely inventing this number, the processing of a single message takes about half a second. So that may seem like a long time, but from the standpoint of latency, this is perfectly fine. Delay of half a second is completely acceptable and within those real-time requirements for this particular business problem, right? Somewhere else it may not be tolerable, but here it's okay. So latency is not a problem actually, it's throughput. It's the rate of messages I can sustain. And uh, being purely sequential, my throughput is bound to my latency and I can handle two messages per second. Where I need to be is somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 messages per second on average, up to even 100 in occasional short bursts which is obvious then uh, that I'm at least in order of magnitude away from my goal. And this happens not, not because of the performance, not because of the algorithm, but the main reason is that I'm inefficient. So for example, that, uh, step number four, storing to the database. Uh, we store a lot of really a pile of stuff goes to the database continuously, and this takes place on the database server, which is another remote machine. 
And while this other remote machine is doing some work for me, I wait for the response, sitting, doing nothing, consuming 0% of whatever hardware is available to me. That's clearly inefficient. There's got to be something else I can do in the meantime. And to do this, I need to untangle this pile of stuff. I'm dealing with many stuff at a single place. I need to untangle this, identify uh, independent or most independent types of work, and run those things separately. And that's essentially how I look at concurrency. So I need to become concurrent. And there are some constraints here. Those steps, one through six, they need to be executed in this particular sequence. Each step produces an intermediate needed for the next one. XML messages must be preserved, the order must be preserved, because order determines chronology of events of what's happening. Finally, step number three, where I'm building the model, I don't want to have concurrency in there, I don't want to have simultaneous manipulations of the same model, because then, of course, I lose integrity and consistency of it. And given all this, the initial thing is pretty simple and straightforward. Each step is turned into an actor, a long-running standing actor. We have exactly one instance of each, so they are kind of like singletons, globals, and we can establish a pipeline of those actors. So when each actor receives a, uh, a message, which is an intermediate from the previous one, it will handle this message, produce its own intermediate, and then send it as a message to the next one. And as soon as it sends this thing, it can take more work because it runs concurrently to everyone else. So we can be more efficient. We can still be dispatching message number one, already started the receiving message number six, and at the same time keeping the order of messages and preserving the integrity of the model because of course an actor handles one message at a time. So my constraints are met and I'm more efficient. It goes without saying that processing of a single message takes the same amount of time, but it's perfectly fine because latency was not my problem anyway. Throughput was. And throughput is now decoupled from latency and bound only to the single slowest element of this pipeline. So given that we have six elements in the pipeline, I'm up to a factor of six better compared to the original approach. And if this is not good enough for me, then I need to make this resistor better. But as it turns out, um, well, this resistor thing, it stores stuff to the database. I actually don't need its result for the user interface. I already have all the data available. So I can completely extract it out of this pipeline and run it concurrently. And there are some other tasks, not database related, that are also needed for user interface. And I can extract those as well and run them out of the pipeline. And by doing this, I'm keeping this main pipeline focused on its main task. And this is important because this pipeline operates under some heavy time constraints. And it doesn't make sense that I wait for something I don't need. That's a waste of time, and time is something I don't have. So, yeah, the idea here is not to be obsessive and trying to parallelize every single line of code. That doesn't make sense. It's about trying to identify units of work and run different things separately. So taking this idea further, when we take a look at those XML messages, each message describes changes to multiple matches. And those matches are completely independent. No dependency between, between two matches whatsoever. So I can take this property, I can take advantage of it, and make processing of a single message concurrent. Instead of having this single, big, one model to rule them all, I can split it and maintain match-specific models, and run match-specific pipelines and factors. So when the match starts, I start the pipeline, keep it running for as long as the match is running, and then stop those actors. And now, for each XML message, I split it per match and forward the corresponding pipelines. And now I'm way more concurrent, right? So I started purely sequential. Now we have big times more than 30, something that 50 matches running, which means we will have about 100 actors in the system. We are way more concurrent. And of course, many of those actors will be idle, waiting for some input. But whatever work I have, at any point in time, it will be chunked. I will have more smaller chunks of work, which I can then just easily spread over whatever hardware is available to me. So I can run things in parallel, I can be more efficient, I can improve my throughput, and I can improve my latency. And on top of all this, I can scale. So I can use hardware to address a significant load increase. And the load here is determined by, by incoming rate of those messages. And uh, this rate heavily correlates to the number of simultaneously running matches. And uh, now I have a strategy and plan to support any number of matches. Uh, right? I can go to any number, I can go to infinity and beyond. So as the number of running matches increases, so the number of those match-specific pipelines. And I will consume more and more and more of my resources, and ultimately I will reach limits of my machine. But then I have some options. Right? I can Either use a more powerful machine, and the system will automatically adapt to it because it's highly concurrent, so I can scale up, or I can cluster multiple machines, uh, have different machines, process different matches, and I can scale out, right? Now I have both options. And finally, I have better fault tolerance. 
So if something happens to go wrong when processing a single match, I can deal with this error there in isolation, at the same time continuing to push everything that works, providing my, most of my service uninterrupted. Why should most of my system that works perfectly fine stop and wait for a single faulty piece to recover? That doesn't make sense. And if I run those things separately, I can deal with those things separately. And that's to me is concurrence. So yeah, that was a very short bit about the job. Extremely short about the HTTP push server. Once we had JSONs from that job, and they arrived to the HTTP push server to correspond to match actors. And each match actor will notify players, so we keep the list of subscribed players, because a player may select matches on the user interface, which need to be presented. So we ultimately don't deal with one stream, we have many streams, player specific streams, and this is how we model it. And then the player actor will notify HTTP request actor, which is where we keep the connection to the browser. This is literally a SOP, it is a state of this actor. And then we tell it to the browser and present our shiny user interface. And the point here is, we have two actors per connected players, this HTTP thing and player. We have more than 5,000 players in peak times, so we have more than 10,000 actors in the system, and the system is still easy to understand. Just because it's highly concurrent doesn't mean it should be highly complex, and concurrency shouldn't apply complexity. And with a proper approach, sensible approach to concurrency, this doesn't happen, and then concurrency becomes a tool, something I can use for my benefit, for my advantage where needed and where appropriate. And this is why I like the exit model approach, because it finally simplifies things in many cases. It is not the solution to all concurrency problems, but I can find it useful in all kinds of situations, some of which you have seen here. So yeah, if you're interested in this topic, maybe you want to learn more, you might also find my upcoming book interesting, where I try to teach how to build highly scalable, concurrent, fault tolerant, distributed, and ultimately highly available systems, relying on these message passing principles and using Elixir programming language and Perla Virtual Machine. The book is due to be printed in April 2015. Already available in early access program, you have the link there. You have the promo code for 43% discount, which is valid for today and tomorrow. So grab it while it's hot. And uh, yeah, I believe it is shameless self plug that I have finished. So, uh, your attention. And the microphone is working from the start. You said that the actor model is not the solution, so in which situations is it not? Yeah, so the, uh, the bank account problem was there, right? Because this bank account will be synchronized stuff, and that's all great. But the thing that doesn't work, because the property of an actor is that it's independent, and it runs independently, and therefore you cannot atomically change two actors. So transaction from one bank account to another cannot be done atomically. And I would say that you need, for example, some transaction of memory for such cases. Uh, it's not a question about actors, but I'm interested uh, when you put out this, uh, this uh, component that does persistence. How did you solve this bottling at the end? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of stuff happening in persist persistence, right? That's what you're asking. The, the talks of the database. Yeah, it's internally concurrent and uh, does some smart batching and some reordering. Uh, it, it, in some cases, it accepts newer messages, refers it to the older ones, and there's some smart stuff happening there because uh, that's a good remark. <coughs> there is still a problem, right? We have extracted persistor, but it still uh, has to. Uh, it has some more breathing space, but it still has to handle a high, huge group. So internally, there's, a, there's more concurrence, but I just didn't have the time for that, sorry. Uh, how do you debug such a system? How do you debug? Yeah, uh, you need to have a lot of uh, logging and tracing, and I will, perform, I will do a small uh, advertising. In Erlang, you have many of those things built in. You can literally uh, connect to the running Erlang system like an SSH. It's like an operating system within an operating system. And you can turn on traces and uh, for all types of things, for different processes, individual processes, for different messages, for different function calls, and you can probe into it. But uh, for the most part, I was logging a pile of stuff, and it would be like a few gigabytes daily. <laughs> this job just, right? Um, and it was very, it was, most of the time, it was easy to detect what went wrong. Yeah. But I just got the pressure. Sorry, uh, if the link is not working, which happens from time to time, it's Manning's fault. But the link is proper, and uh, I will tweet it. Uh, what is the broken site? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, that's not the cat, sorry. But it will work. <laughs> they probably didn't implement it in their life. Hi, uh, can you contrast the active model with the mi microservices thread? Um, well, I don't believe, I don't think that they uh, even attack the same problem, right? Microservices is from what I can gather mostly about deployment and convenience of uh, uh, being able to deploy individual stuff, right, without having to restart everything. So there are probably some resemblances and you will have to use messaging to communicate with it, right? In that sense, uh, yeah, but uh, from what I gather, the point of microservices is mostly uh, some granularization of stuff. You can do this in Erlang because it has a uh, uh, hot code, code, code swapping, so you can update things without starting it. Yeah. But this, if you have different things and they communicate via messages, so there's no data sharing here already in the anchor zone. That's it. Sure. Uh, you said that you send messages in a fire fire forget manner, and uh, basically, when you fire a message, uh, how do you handle? Uh, I mean, how do you know that the message actually gets to the receiver, and how do you handle the er errors in that case? Is because it's fire and forget, and you cannot know if the message arrived or not. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, initially, you don't. And messages have like uh, really like network uh, packet semantics, right? This file forgets is like UDP, and if you want something back, then you request for the response and wait for it, and maybe it will time out, and then you will uh, proclaim an error. But, or you don't know what happened. You may get a timeout, but it may still be there and be processed at some point in time. You have to deal with that stuff. So it is sometimes said that those actor things are internally already distributed, even if you don't run them on multiple machines. But uh, it's therefore more easier to go uh, to distribution zone because you're already dealing with those problems. Erlang has some additional stuff where you can link processes and this means that when one process dies, others will get information, notification, and they can know there are there patterns in the general libraries, right? When you send a message and want a response, you first link to the process, send a message and then you will either get a response or a failure message and you can know whether it failed or not. Hi, I have a question. Uh, how do you handle high availability? Uh, well, high availability, I talked about this in the last time, so maybe you should <laughs> search for the YouTube presentation, but the gist of it is you need to have uh, scalability so you can address increasing load, you need to have distribution so you can have multiple machines running and supporting things, if one dies, other works, right? And uh, you need to be responsive, so if uh, something happens, some long CPU bound job uh, is running, it doesn't take over your entire system, so those are kind of the ideas. And then ultimately, yeah, the idea is that Erlang is built around this, that you, uh, you kind of predict that anything can fail, and then you build on these patterns that uh, can constrain individual errors and recover from them, those supervisor patterns and propagation of errors across um, uh, concurrent systems. Hello. Um, do you have a constant number of actors, or do you have some sort of a director who knows how many actors you have Dependent, let's you only matches. Yeah, you only need to keep the count of them, right? Unless you need for your own specific needs. But uh, uh, so that thing where we, for example, create those matches uh, dynamically, right? It will be uh, something that has to map. I have to know whether this match pipeline already exists or not, right? So that I create multiple copies for the same match. Yeah. Yeah. Was that not the question? Yeah. But then you have to have somebody who, who over, uh, oversees all, all the matches and everything that happens. How do you handle that concurrency? Because somebody needs to know what's happening. You know, if you have uh, in one point uh, 100 matches and then 50 matches, who, who handles? Uh, you mean who handles the mapping, right? Who knows that this thing is exactly. Uh, initially, this can be an actor, and I would say in the canonical actor system, this could be an actor, right? So it is a bottleneck, but it does very little processing. And, it, it can go very, very high, right? It just does look up and returns this or that. Uh, in Erlang, we do have uh, different things, right? It's not all about vectors. We have uh, something like an internal key value store, uh, which, uh, which basically is the button. Like it's internally concurrent, implemented in C, gives you some basic synchronization things or some basic uh, isolation guarantees. You can look up and put it there safely, and when you get it, you have a copy, no one else 
can modify it, and this is used as a so-called process registry. This is a frequent pattern in the program. Okay, and how do you synchronize it across uh, multiple machines in Pathway? Yeah, you have the chat, then you have the chat, and this may or may not become an issue. Okay, we have time for one more question. Or not? Okay, thanks, Sasha. <laughs>